I'm June Sarpong and I'm the author of Diversify. And Diversify looks at the social, moral and economic benefits of diversity. Is it a critical ingredient to be diverse and inclusive to be a successful business? And What's my answer, answer might surprise you, I said no. But it is a critical ingredient if you want to stay there. People will not notice you're the diversity hire when you start smashing it out the park. Two days before I got into Harvard, the funding body contacted me to say that my sponsors had defaulted, oh. so I wouldn't have the funding. I had to face the dark reality that I'd have to crowdfund to get there. Which was what, how much? Uh, 64,000 pounds. In a month, you raised 64,000 pounds. That's amazing. I was in a business where the black male was not a model figure that was supposed to be the person going out to win jobs and be in industry. In this radically changing world, if your business is built on the assumption that diversity and inclusion is a nice to have, it's an unstable territory. In case you're wondering, BAME stands for Black Asian Minority Ethnic. We have to realize just what racism is, and people don't like the R word but we have to use it if we're gonna get this stuff fixed, if we're gonna clean this stuff out. Because yes, it's uncomfortable, it, we're awkward, but it's real. And we have to look at why we think the way we do. And it's not about being judgmental. For me, it's understanding where this stuff has come from, how you unpick it, and then what the new thing is that we're trying to create. And I think that's the exciting bit. So Alan, what have you got for me this time? Well, I thought this time this came from the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, which looked at an analysis of labour force survey data, and it's comparing pay for the same occupation. So this is, if you like, a lens through which you can start to see how more differently are people being paid for doing the same job. And this is like for like. This Unlike is like the for gender like. pay gap. Exactly. Yeah, so this, this is, is like the, for like. This is the gap compared to white British men. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really striking chart because one of the things that you can quite clearly see is that since 2008, mm. since the financial crisis, the pay gap's widening. Yeah. It's a situation that's getting worse. Yeah. And it's not the same for all minorities, yeah. right? Like, so actually, Chinese men for the same occupation are actually being paid slightly more. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the suggested reasons the Pakistani and Bangladeshi men doing the same job are likely to be younger, for example. So there could oh, be some age elements okay. where they're what an about age the component. Black African and Black Caribbean? Um, here, you're in the realms of speculation because we don't know enough. What the data shows us is intriguing. One of the things it does show us is that there is likely to be a discriminatory element to this because those gaps are pretty wide yeah. in, in some categories. It's one of those things where you want to break it down even further yeah. and start to, to, to understand some of the dynamics affecting each of these particular Good. groups. If I show you the same chart but for women, what, what do you think? Okay. How interesting. And there's actually quite a few groups which are being paid wow. more than white British women. So Black the Chinese. Caribbean. Yeah. But sim similar trends as well. Again, a worsening since 2008. This is when we head into unconscious bias territory, for sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it, we have to call yeah. it out. We have to talk about this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, I think it just shows you the problem of just referring to it as a single category, right? Yes. Like kind of BAME yes. <laughs> as a single thing, right? Like it's not. It's a very. How about that, right? right? Um, yeah. You can clearly see that it's not. Very interesting with the Black Caribbean group. Yes, it yeah. is. It's really very interesting. I mean, in fact, particularly on the women's chart, what's interesting is that oh. the fact that it's going in the opposite direction to the Pakistani, Bangladeshi and black African categories. And how much black Caribbean women outperform their men? Yeah, too. exactly. That's but, something that needs yeah. to be explored. Yeah, that's right, because on the chart, you can yeah. see they, they have completely yeah. different trajectories. Completely different really trajectories. Really odd. So this data is fascinating because it just encourages you to ask more questions. Yeah. It, we're certainly not at any sort of end point that no. says, right, you know, here are all the answers to all the questions. Yeah. But, you know, rather like with the gender pay gap, when we were talking about that, we said, well, you know, the first step is having some data. Mm. Um, but it really is just a first step. So, um, Sriti and Karen, uh, the McGregor Review found that if BAME talent progressed at the same rates as their white counterparts, an additional £24 billion pounds could be added uh, to the UK economy each year. There is enough <coughs> evidence, isn't there, in terms of you know, the McGregor Review or whether it's about the McKinsey reports mm. that shows that those companies which are more 
ethnically diverse outperform those less so by 33 percent in yeah. the latest update of the diversity matters report so in 2001 the BAME population in the UK was worth 32 billion in 2011 it was 300 billion oh my that's a huge audience you're missing out if you don't really think about how you communicate and how you involve them in your particular organisation and your business as a purchasing power. Yeah. So I think facts and stats speak for themselves in terms of you know, evidence that more diverse teams tend to be more productive teams and more profitable teams, but also in terms of the purchasing power. But race is hard to talk about. Mm. Uh, yeah. And in a boardroom, it's one of those areas that still now people feel uncomfortable talking about it. Being in the room. Well, Sheryl Sandberg encourages us to lean in. What I say is often <laughs> we're not even in the room to lean in. What every organisation needs to ask itself is, is everyone in the room? And if everyone isn't in the room, why not? And what are you doing to address that? Now, I know as a black woman, I am often the only one in the room. And that brings with it some extra pressure in that I know that I don't have the luxury of being mediocre. I don't have the luxury of not being prepared. And often, I'm the most ignored person in the room. Therefore, I've had to learn how to volunteer my opinion. I'm Rick Lewis. I'm chairman and co-chief executive of Tristan Capital Partners. When I first got here, it was a bit of a shock. I mean, I grew up in the States in the post-civil rights U.S. environment that was encouraging of other people to get into the workforce. I don't mean that there isn't prejudice, there isn't, you know, bias. But effectively, whether you call it affirmative action or help, a lot of businesses were at least encouraging of a more diverse, open yeah. workforce. And I was certainly a benefactor. When I moved over here, I felt like I moved back into the U.S. in the 70s. Wow. But I also noticed something else that was really important. The difference is that I was regarded, and this is a shame, but I was regarded differently than English yes. black folks. Yes. And it was something about, like, I was other enough and well-educated from the right schools, and so I was included in the clubs. Yeah. It seems like a paradox to me, but people that grew up in the system were put in a box and their aspirations were contained, whereas I didn't feel that containment. The intersectionality of race and class uh, is something very important that we all need to understand because often we don't allow for nuance when it comes to BAME. If you look at the BAME individuals that are actually progressing in the workplace, that are getting to senior positions, they are just brown and black versions of the white people who are progressing in the corporate world. And I think we need to take this one step further. I think we need to open it out. We have to figure out how we make sure that regardless of a person's background, that we're able to pick that talent and bring them into our organisation and allow them to be themselves. Probably the most interesting data set to look at is the data set that's been produced by the Social Mobility Commission. And what that does is it breaks down the country into the 300 124 Regions. local authorities yeah. and it ranks them based on a, a whole range of different indicators about how well each local authority is performing and what I mean by performing is basically what are the prospects yeah. of a disadvantaged student that's what we're if really looking you at are here. Raised in that if area. you're growing up in that area yeah. and this is the overall ranking of uh, social mobility for England in 2017 and so what we've done here on this map is just divided it into the top half and the bottom half. The green areas here are the top 50 areas and the next 50 areas. The so green is high social mobility. These pinky areas are the ones which are at the bottom of the social mobility yeah. rankings. For me this is a really interesting map because this is not a map of the haves and the have-nots. Yeah. It's the map of where do I stand a chance, yeah. right? Like where, where are my chances going to be greater? If you look at the moment London here on the social mobility index uh, map comes out very very well so we go to the overall index it's it's this sea of green so mm -hmm. these top areas yeah. if we actually look at a different measure which is deprivation london looks very different mm -hmm. so we're breaking it down to much smaller levels which is why it looks like much more of a mosaic yeah. you know a similar sort of color scheme in that the pink here is the more deprived areas yes. 
the green is the less deprived areas. Um, and one thing that you can see here is that London is not that continuous wash of green. No, we know that London is a city of contrast. We're going to zoom into an area that you might be just a little bit familiar with, okay. um, June, which is um, Waltham Forest. Ah. <laughs> Um, and so here we've got our colouring of deprivation and you can see that within the borough obviously there's wow. this colour scheme is about there's the, a lot of pink in Wolfing Forest. Yeah, and this is the top 10% nationally most deprived, this brightest pink. So in a national context that's quite deprived. Uh, there are some pockets of green, green as, yeah. as well. What we're going to do here is now take this uh, colour mm. and reinforce it with a bit of a, a treatment that brings it out into a much more different view Ooh, of things. this is very posh. Yeah. But what this is kind of showing us is that, you know, the cliff edges that you've got. This is deprivation where these are the highly deprived areas. And you How can see... interesting, though, that we've got this sea of green surrounded by yeah. all this deprivation. That's why it's really important to notice that that the haves and the have-nots don't have to live miles away from each other. I know for myself, without having gone to a really good state school, there's no way I'd be where I am today. We had amazing teachers who just expected the best from us. It was incredibly aspirational. And even though there were so many of us that came from quite poor backgrounds, we were around children who came from relatively affluent backgrounds. We could see that there was a bigger tomorrow. The intersectionality of class is something that Andy Haldane touched on. Imagine this is the chief economist of the Bank of England, someone who presents as the embodiment of privilege and power. But sometimes you can be surprised. Along some dimensions, everyone feels like a minority, mm. right? So I was the first phase of, well, you know, I, I look like the archetypical, yeah, white, middle-aged, middle-class man. Yes. At the point I joined the bank, I was the first wave of state school oh. northerner, wow. right? So uh, for most of my bank career, which is a long time now, I've actually felt like an outsider, okay. despite mm. looking, to all intents and purposes, yeah. like the like quintessential insider. Yep. insider. Mm. And there's something of that, I think, in everyone. You know, everyone's felt a bit of an outsider some of the time. Mm -hmm. And asking everyone to think about the situations where they were put in a slightly vulnerable position, yeah. mm. might be inside work, might be outside work, mm. is actually, I, I think, very important. I mean, the social mobility dimension is, really needs a push. Mm. Yes. Uh, gender is moving too slowly, but it's moving. Mm. Ethnicity issues are moving too slowly, but they're moving. Mm. Social mobility is going yes, backwards. Going backwards. Uh, yeah. on, on many of the metrics. Mm. What about bringing those voices into who we employ? It's almost the most uh, invisible form of discrimination that we have mm. going on, which is... Particularly in the UK. In the UK, yeah. you know, the categorizations, the sort of the accents, every, yeah. how we judge yeah. and who we bring in. Yeah. It starts so young mm. that yes. you almost sort of really uh, embedded that before, before these kids grow up and then... And then they don't We've stand lost. a chance. And also yeah. what we lose out on as a society in terms of the cultural influence in terms of actually shaping what Britain is as a nation when we're not unleashing the potential of so much of our yeah. citizens. It makes no yeah. sense. I want to see the people that I grew up with authentically themselves in senior positions of power, being able to run organisations without having to conform. And I don't know how you get there. And I don't know if perhaps I'm asking for too much at this stage, but Rick Lewis certainly has ideas. One of the things that we found in the data is that when it comes to race, often you find that the type of people of colour that succeed within uh, the corporate structure have often gone through perhaps the Russell Group system or are themselves from actually quite middle-class backgrounds. So my question is, how do we change culture so that wherever there's talent, talent has a chance to be yeah. developed? I think the aspiration of having the talent pool be truly the widest it can possibly be, mm -hmm. diversity of all things, including sort of socioeconomic background and upbringing and you know, bias and leaning would make sense. The unpopular thing that I'm going to say is that any pathway to progress starts with the pioneer stage, right. where some people get in that are different, but those people that are deciding are comfortable with, 
and they start to change it. I truly believe that that's where we are. Mm. I saw that happen in the U.S. I okay. think that's what's happening here. It's but I think we have to be yeah. realistic that, you know, as we right. get in the inside, it's incumbent upon us to keep the pace of change. So keep the conversation up, keep the fight up, and then when you get a chance, when one gets a chance to change the mix, to broaden the room, to help people often subconsciously get comfortable with difference, that's the moment. I get it. Right. <laughs> so what does social mobility look like in action? The first step in, in changing your aspiration bubble is you have to see yourself in the movie. Yes. Then you have to believe that you belong in the movie. Yeah. And then there's a the whole thing about affording the movie yeah. um, and getting some support to encourage when you stumble along the way in the movie. Hello, my name's Isaiah Wellington Lynn. I crowdfunded £64,000 in four weeks to fund my place at Harvard after my scholarship fell through. The campaign was called Stratford to Harvard. I think this location is uh, very special because Stratford used to be a very deprived, rundown area. Um, filled with a lot of poverty, and it still is to some extent. But I think this part of Stratford represents progression mm -hmm. and regeneration, and I think that's been a large part of my story. Newham, for okay. example. Um, Which is where Isaiah grew up. That's right. Yeah. And Newham, again, it's a very similar pattern here to Walton Forest, because actually um, they both score very, very highly on the social mobility index that mm. we were looking at before. So these mm. are areas that are you know, scoring very, very highly on social mobility, but overall deprivation is striking. Striking? Really, well, I really mean, with striking. Newham, you've only got a tiny patch of That's green. right. In Newham, virtually everything is skyscrapers of deprivation. And it will be really interesting to see the next release of uh, the deprivation Particularly for index. an area like Newham. That's right, where there's been a, a targeted investment yeah. to try and address some of the long-standing problems. Do you think that the regeneration that happened in this area impacted you in the sense that perhaps had there not been an investment in this community, mm. do you think that maybe your story wouldn't have been possible? I think my story would have been possible because um, of the people I had in my life who ensured that regardless of the limited resources around me, I was still able to pursue my potential, so my mum and other key mentors. So tell me about the Harvard project. It was interesting because Harvard wasn't one of the options, really. I created it as an option for myself, mm -hmm. and I remember speaking to a few of my tutors, and they said, that's not really going to be possible. Why? And it had never been done before. Um, no, at least from my background, who had a similar story to me, I just made sure that I was persistent. I provided all of the materials that my tutors needed to write my references and get to know more about me. And then I applied. And then two days before I got into Harvard, the funding body contacted me to say that my sponsors had defaulted. Oh. So I had to face the stark reality that I'd have to crowdfund to get there. And I was very apprehensive about doing that because I knew how much work, energy, and <laughs> you know, yeah. to be honest, vulnerability it would take for me to share my story and evoke the kind of support I needed. And um, it hit me once I got to Harvard that I occupied so many competing identities. Okay, how so? so? As, as a, a young black boy of African Caribbean heritage, having grown up in, in London, that was like one identity. And then growing up in a, a low income, deprived lone parent family was another identity. Having studied at top UK university was another identity. I was thinking, okay, uh, where do I fit in here? <laughs> there was no one who I could reach out fully to. Fully identify. Yeah, fully with. identify with. I mean, that was very difficult and very challenging. And I must say, at times I felt like going back to London, I was like, okay, I've worked so hard to get here. Peace out. Peace out. <laughs> it's too hard. That's um, how I and felt. so you've done a lot of internships. And do you think, do you think race has played a role in that in the sense that you know that perhaps things are not equal, it's not a level playing field, so therefore you need more on your CV than your white counterpart? I must say it's very draining, draining in terms of the work you have to put into applying for these internships, but then once you start it's also draining because there's this added burden of race mm. and it's not something that I can escape, it's not something I can peel off in the morning and then put back on in the evening, it's kind of there all the time. But actually when you bring in masculinity and race that's a different experience in terms of black men being seen as a source of fear yeah. a primary source yeah. of fear and what that represents when you're in the corporate world and how people relate to you yeah so you hit the nail on the head that was another element of my identity that was also in conflict 
and um, I had to find different ways to mitigate against you know um, misconceptions. Assumptions, yeah. Everyone faces imposter syndrome to some extent. Yes, we all do. But you can still do. But when you're the only yeah. different person in your team, you face a whole nother level of imposter syndrome. Can you explain that more? So it's kind of a constant battle, and it can have quite shocking you know, impacts on how you navigate different spaces because you're often second guessing every decision that you make. It can lead to intense anxiety. Do any executives watching this, wanting to get diversity right, wanting to figure out how to create workplaces that people of color can feel welcome and people of color can thrive in, what's your advice to them? My advice would be that we exist and there are people in this world, in London, in, you know, in the UK who occupy many different identities and therefore are able to understand how best to create and design an experience for different people. For multiple people. For multiple people. And I think that's the key, that you're not just hiring a black person, you're hiring someone who comes with a suitcase of experiences of how to navigate particular spaces. And then when you translate that into corporate value, it's exponential. It's priceless. I think Isaiah's story shows us just how broken our system is. Imagine, had he not been so entrepreneurial, there's no way he would have made it to Harvard. And think of the countless Isaiahs that are being lost through the system because there's nothing in place to make sure that these kids who have the ability, who have the potential, are also being provided with the finances to be able to fulfill that potential. It shouldn't take such exceptional talent, such all-consuming determination, for people of colour from disadvantaged backgrounds to get access to the corporate world. What would you say to uh, any business leader or HR manager in terms of, number one, why it makes sense uh, to go and actually seek diverse talent, particularly talent from BAME backgrounds? And number two, what is the thing that they can do to make sure that that talent feels welcome within their organisation? There's a couple of reasons. The first is just that you're missing out on a whole population that's really talented mm -hmm. and why wouldn't you pick yeah. the best and brightest yeah. of the entire basket yeah. rather than just a portion of the basket. Exactly. So that's one reason. Mm -hmm. The second is that, you know, times are changing yeah. and the crowd, the rebel crowd, is going to start to form at your door. <laughs> like, it just is. It's like, so if you rest on your are. laurels, yeah. sooner or later it will catch up for you. I think the one recommendation I have is broad is Think about the culture of your department, your group, mm -hmm. your organization, and your business. And is that well suited to accomplishing these business goals? And if it's not, start to change it. Yeah. But that change is hard if you're a big organization, if you are a FTSE company, you're Fortune 500, you've been around for decades and decades, in some cases centuries. How do you change culture? How do you do it? Baby steps. Start moving. It's the same recipe. It just may take you longer to change culture and change the numbers. What's your opinion on targets and, and goals? Yeah, I, I like aspirations. I, words like aspirations and vectors and, and um, targets rather than quotas. I, just, I think that there's a negative connotation to sort of filling a certain number. Mm. I think if you, I mean, this is, I'm going to take a, the easy way out perhaps, but I think if you start talking about what you're trying to accomplish and what you believe will help you accomplish that, you start rounding into an approach. Um, Can I push back a little bit? It's funny how when it comes to this issue, we don't, we're uncomfortable quantifying because, you know, I don't know a single company, a single successful company that doesn't set itself financial targets. And everyone within that organization knows what they're working towards and what the company is expected to generate in terms of income by such and such a time. And it's funny how when it comes to this, we want to be a little bit more relaxed. I think you're right. But I think there's two reasons for one for and one against. I think mm. It's a matter of trust, right? If you don't define the hard target, you're, I think what you're saying is one could mistrust that you actually have the intent to achieve it. I think that's fair. I think the other part that I think where people are careful is saying, 
a couple of missteps and then people will stop trying. I think we need to redefine where we place diversity within the company structure. At the moment, it tends to fall under CSR. We see it as a charity thing, a nice thing to do. But actually, this needs to go into R&D, research and development. Because if you are a company that wants to be around 50 years from now, 100 years from now, then diversity is essential for your survival. And this is where you must invest.